it was almost like the recession didn't happen here. I mean, if I'm being honest, that's, that's really what it felt like. Uh, now, I'm not saying, you know, we don't sell as many houses as we used to. I mean, there, there, are, some, there are some things that are different than, you know, earlier last decade, but the natural gas industry, you can't look at this economy and, and fail to recognize what it's, what it's done. Um, you know, what, what I like to say is, um, and I don't think that, that people throughout Arkansas still understand the impact that it's, that it's having. Um, if we were to recruit a car, an automotive manufacturing plant to Arkansas, that would be about a billion dollar investment and it'd be a couple thousand jobs and we would love it and we would talk about it and we would hear about it forever. Well, just Southwestern Energy is investing a billion dollars every year, at least, and has in the last several years. I mean, they announced this year, this coming, well, I guess it's this year now, 2012, I think they're investing $1.2 billion. That's one year. And it was down $100 million and that was the headline, you know, that they were reducing their investment still happy to have a billion dollars being invested in five counties, including this one. You know, you cannot, and, and I, I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit because there is a, there's a history of, of this industry in South Arkansas, so you aren't completely unaware of what it means or what it does um, like we were. Uh, but it has been incredible for us. It's been incredible in the number of jobs that it's created. It's been incredible in the amount of revenue that we see in our community, um, whether it's um, a landowner who, um, you know, is, is bringing in a royalty check every month to the bank. I mean, our banks have seen some pretty amazing deposits from individuals who um, may have had little to nothing outside their land. Um, so it is, it is changing people's lives, really. Um, I think it is creating generational wealth that this part of Arkansas has never seen. Um, if you look at, there was a report that came out in the uh, Democrat Gazette a few months back that in the second quarter of 2011, personal income in Arkansas rose, I think it was 1.2%. And the economists said it was directly attributable to the Fayetteville shale. So if you think about that, what happened in five counties moved the entire needle in Arkansas up. So if, if, if that hadn't happened, what, what I think probably would have happened is that needle would have gone down based on what's happened to manufacturing jobs. So not only did it move the needle up, but it moved it up to the baseline. Um, you know, this is real stuff, and again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir just because people in South Arkansas have understood how this industry works and, and what it can do. I mean, there's obviously generational wealth in South Arkansas that has been there forever, and I feel like for the first time we're seeing that happen in the, in the hills of the, the Ozark Mountains. Um, we uh, go back to, I think it was probably probably May of 2005, and I had um, a uh, couple guys from Southwestern Energy come in my office, and uh, I recognized the name from the days, I guess, they were headquartered in Arkansas. I was somewhat aware of them. Um, and they handed me a business card and said they were looking for some warehouse space. And I could not figure out why <coughs> they, would, they would want warehouse space in Conway, so I asked a couple questions, and and they said, well, you know, we've been exploring for natural gas. And I thought that was the strangest thing I had ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I just could not get my head around it. Um, you know, it was like someone telling me the world was flat, I guess. It was just something that I didn't know was even a possibility. Um, and so I just, I almost... I mean, I answered their questions and gave them the information and almost discounted it. And then the next day, 
Um, oddly enough, um, a guy from Schlumberger came in, and after I figured out how to say their name and not butcher it, and call it Schlumberger, which is what I thought when I read it on the paper. Um, you know, I read, I read. They, he actually left me a message, so I looked it up online and saw that it was one of the world's largest publicly traded companies. And then I was thinking, okay, this, there must be something to this. So he came in, and he was wonderful. He really explained everything to me, and, and I cannot tell you how shocked I was. I mean, it really, it was really shocking to those of us who um, had lived here our whole lives and, and really didn't know that was even a possibility. So as it started to unfold, it, it really unfolded quickly. Now they had, you know, Southwestern Energy had done a very good job of, of going in and leasing up property quietly. Um, and, you know, my, my mother at the time had just retired from uh, about 30 years in, in banking in Heber Springs. Um, and so when I went to, to tell them I, that weekend, I, it was Mother's Day, and I went home and I said, don't lease your minerals until I know what you're supposed to do. And of course, my dad thought, well, that'll never happen. And uh, I was so shocked. And Mom said, oh, yeah, they've been doing that for the last two or three years. You know, so people in banks knew, just people weren't talking about it. Um, but then it, it really started to hit quickly for us. Schlumberger came in um, with a major presence. They were really our first vendor that, that came in and, and built something. And they actually bought property from us. Uh, and to give you some example of where they thought they were going to be versus where they are, when they came in, they were building facilities to house 200 workers. And now they have 450. And they completely ran out of space on the 20 acres they bought from us. And they had gone in. They put two other divisions into a vacant um, manufacturing facility, the old Baldwin piano facility. They probably have half of it taken to um, dozens. I mean, there we 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 haven't ever tracked the vendors. That's kind of hard for us to do um, because really the, the gas companies are the only ones that can accurately do that. And honestly, I don't think they have time to do that. Um, but if you if you drive around our industrial areas in town. Dozens. I mean, they're probably sixty to a hundred in Conway, and then there are probably that many more up Highway sixty-five and twenty-five going into Greenbrier and uh, Bee Branch and Damascus and Guy. Uh, I never thought I would ever see an industrial park in Guy, Arkansas, but there is one now. It probably has. 10 to 12 tens. Um, so it is uh, just incredible. It's been incredible. Um, we love to benchmark. It's one of the big things that we like to do. And so early on in talking to the Schlumberger people, I asked the question, could you direct us to a place where we could learn about, where we can learn about this, this industry and uh, he advised us to go to Cleburne, Texas. And Cleburne is just south of Fort Worth. They were one of the only counties in uh, Texas historically that really didn't have oil or gas until the development of the Barnett Shale. And the Barnett was really the first one of these shale plays that took off. And so we spent a day with the folks in Cleburne in um, 2006, I guess, early 2006. And, uh, they were great. Learned a lot. Um, our fire department went back. I think the mayor, when he gets here, can talk more about this. But I'm pretty sure our fire department went back a couple times to um, visit with not only Cleburne but with Fort Worth. You know, Fort Worth is really the epicenter of urban drilling. I mean, the Barnett they're drilling throughout the city of Fort Worth, and so um, we did some, I believe, some training with them on hazmat issues that the fire department might get involved in. Um, I'll never forget the guy uh, who does my job in Cleveland said, 
early in the conversation, he said, it comes down to water and roads and mineral rights. And he said, if you have your mineral rights, you think it's the best thing that ever happened to you. If you don't, you don't. And that's played out. city's perspective, we almost have the best of both worlds because there is no drilling in the city. You know, it, it doesn't stretch this far south, but all the companies are here. I shouldn't say all, but Southwestern Energy is here with a new $30 million headquarters, so that's huge, and the schlumbergers of the world. Um, so really, we don't, we don't hear We don't hear the negative stuff out of out of the people that live in the city. The people that are here, I would say, feel like it's great. You know, our hotels are full. We've had a hotel building boom. If you've been through here over the last five years, I mean, we're putting up hotels right and left. Our restaurants are doing well. We have not had a year where our restaurants did not do at least five to seven percent increases over the previous year, and that's with adding several new ones. Been a restaurant boom, and and um, it's pretty conspicuous. You know, the Schlumberger guys wear bright blue jumpsuits, so you know them when you see them in restaurants. And there's not a day that you go to lunch here somewhere that you don't see people from the industry, uh, whether they're business folks or guys that work out in the field. And so the restaurant and hotel folks know really well how impactful this has been. It obviously is having an impact on just overall sales tax collections too. Um, again, we feel, you know, we are the largest city closest to most of all this activity. So a lot of that disposable income comes back in to, to Conway. And um, so we're, we're seeing good growth there too. Um, I just got our numbers in for the month of December for our restaurants um, because we have an A&P tax so they really collect that in real time um, and our restaurants were up 15% in December over December of, of 10 which was pretty amazing for us. Um, Conway's dry on hotels, 2% on restaurants. The restaurants is obviously the most lucrative part because they're doing, this year those restaurants will probably do $120 million collectively. And that's everything. I mean, you're, you're, you're taxing your um, concession stand at your movie theater. You're taxing prepared foods in delis and your grocery stores. So it, it, it's coming from a lot of different places that you may not think when you just start thinking about that tax. But that 2% for us has done some great things. We've built um, nationally competitive park facilities. Um, and the mayor could talk a little bit more about that. But we have a girls fast pitch softball complex and a boys baseball complex that we just opened last year. And I would put them up against anybody anywhere in, in America. Um, and part of that AP money is, is being used to retire debt on, uh, on those complexes as well as expanding our trail system. Um, and then, um, obviously, some of it is going to the commission for us to um, market the area. And the chamber has a contract with the AMP commission to offer those services. So our niche is really um, sports marketing. That's really what we're going after, our youth um, baseball, softball, basketball tournaments, because um, obviously those are kids know how much time you spend on the road and how much money you spend when you go places. And um, so that's what that's what that money is really going for. What is y'all sales tax local city sales tax? Uh, the county
county has a half cent and we get none of that. Um, and then the city has one and three quarter cents. And then there is a separate tax on mixed drinks. Now, that's through the state. So, I mean, you do it we have a local piece too. Local mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what that is, but when the mayor gets here, he can tell you. So your, I mean, your, your bill, whether it's at McDonald's or Mike's place, is your, your tax is 10 and a quarter. And then you have the 2% uh, mixed drinks is on top of that? That would be, yeah, that'd be on top of it. So it's not, it's not cheap to have a mixed drink, for sure. Questions? I read where you all expressed that you asked him to buy the place for alcohol. Is this part of the reason for your success or the key to that success? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, obviously we were very vocal in fighting to change that law. Um, what, what Conway had seen was, um, you know, we had grown to a point where there, were, there was an expectation from our business community that we have a certain level of services here. And we didn't have it. You know, I mean, you have a... $1.3 billion technology company that at the time was based in Conway, and that being Axiom. And there were a variety of reasons that they moved their headquarters to Little Rock, but I mean, I have letters from Charles Morgan indicating that part of that was that they're bringing Fortune 500 company folks to our community, and we don't have a hotel that's appropriate for them to stay in, and we don't have restaurants that are appropriate for them to eat in. Um, so we, we saw that happening. Um, we also had a downtown that had seen better days that once it once five o'clock came, you could have shot a shotgun down Front Street and hit nobody. And we were pretty certain that a part of extending the life of downtown was to be able to attract the type of restaurants that would stay open late. And um, that meant that they needed to be able to serve alcohol and beverages. And so we took a fairly strong stand in the 2001, 2003, and 2005 legislative <coughs> session and had some success in changing the law, which actually benefited every community in Arkansas, not just us. But, but we were the ones that fought it. We were the ones that raised money locally. Um, we were, uh, I think the, the, the interesting thing for us was making that first step. There was such a fear from people in the business community that, that people would boycott them if they came out and said that they were for something. And we had a lot of businesses that just said, you know what, if somebody's going to boycott me because of that, then they can just boycott me. But this is what we need. So we did it. Mike's Place, we're going to eat lunch today, is the first restaurant that we got with a private club. We were um, determined that that permit would go to somebody that would go downtown. Mike is a great guy. He uh, has spent his whole life in the restaurant industry managing chains. That's, that's where he cut his teeth. In Dallas and Little Rock, here he came here with Marketplace. He actually is from he went to UCA, um, but he came back to Conway with Marketplace Grill, and he really wanted to go to the interstate. And um, we said we wouldn't support any application. That first application had to be a downtown. So he took three derelict buildings, and if you hadn't been there, you'd be shocked at how nice it is. Um, and put in a restaurant that continues to be one of the top grossing restaurants in our community in spite of how many chains we have. Um, and literally, and I'm not making it up, literally uh, overnight when he opened up, downtown Conway changed. And we had $50 million of private investment that followed that first, uh, first investment on his part. Um, now, there are parking problems at night in downtown Conway which is amazing, amazing. Um, you know, we have, um, like 
I said probably 30, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but most every chain would have a private club permit now. Um, there have been some people that have gotten them and then given them back. I mean, it's, it's not the, you know, if you have bad food, it's not going to save you. Um, and the thing that we like about our situation is the private club law does give you the ability to control things. Um, each one of those, their hours are dictated individually. Um, it also gives us the ability to fight something that we don't think is appropriate for the community. Um, and pretty much it would be hard, I think, for someone to get a permit if the mayor and us and other community leaders came out and fought it at the ABC. I think it would be hard. Um, but I think it's been great. It certainly, we certainly wouldn't be doing $120 million in restaurant sales in a year's time if that hadn't happened because a lot of these folks wouldn't have come. How much pushback did you have? Rough. We lost the first time. We lost in 2001, but you know, there's nothing like a good beating to teach you how to win the next time. <laughs> because we didn't know, we didn't know who we were fighting against. That was that was the main thing. Is we went down very naive, thinking that it was about a, it was about voting. We wanted we wanted the right to vote for mixed drinks in the city. Well, when you start trying to mess with any kind of voting law as it pertains to liquor, you're gonna get creamed. The private club is a completely different issue. It's, it's almost, I think, the gentleman's agreement in Arkansas because these private clubs cannot, they can't purchase their liquor wholesale. They have to go to the retailers and, and purchase it. So those county line liquor stores, it's good business for them. What we figured out was, though, that your private club, your private club owners were actually bootlegging based on Arkansas law. So we had to go back in and change another law that would allow them legally, I guess, to bring that quantity back in <laughs> to the county <laughs> because that's what they're that's what they're doing. I mean, if you talk to our restaurant owners, that's the thing they hate the most. I mean, you, you are driving truckloads of liquor back in from Morgan to Conway to furnish their bar because they can't they can't take delivery in the city. So were y'all the ones that implemented the most of the over possession law that I'm talking about? Or over possession in the county for bringing it in and No that that was that law was was there and we tweaked the law so that those private club owners could bring those quantities back over into, into the account. I mean, that's just one of those things you didn't think about when you passed it the first time until someone said something about it. Um, but it's been great. I mean, our downtown is great. We have, um, you know, Mike is probably doing <coughs> between one and a half and $2 million a year in sales. Old Chicago Pizza is doing well over a million dollars a year in sales. Um, so we we have proven really too that that large scale restaurants work in downtown. I mean, when he opened up, I can't even tell you how many people said it wasn't going to work for a million different reasons, and it's worked. Everything about it has worked, and and he could probably tell you how much the oil and gas industry has meant to him too, as could any restaurant owner. Tell me a little bit about the impacts that you've seen on Conway as a direct result of Southwestern Energy. Um, I can't say enough about them. I mean, they are an incredible corporate citizen here. Um, one of our biggest supporters in the chamber world. Um, we have an extremely close working relationship with them, but the direct impact I would say is just, I mean, we have a, what it amounts to a regional headquarters based here um, that employs 
several hundred people on its own. So that is, that's accounting folks, marketing folks, government affairs people, um, engineers, <coughs> tons of engineers. So, you know, just what those type of highly paid white collar professionals are going to bring is, is huge. They're going to buy houses and they're going to buy good houses, you know. But, I mean, they, they all, and that's the thing about the industry that I think is so misunderstood by people that don't understand oil and gas is that the guy that's out there working in the field is making seventy or $80,000 a year. So he's buying a house too. I mean, it, it's really not a blue collar, white collar thing. I mean, all the jobs are good. Now, some of them are hard, obviously, but, you know, those people are great consumers too. I mean, you know, I, what I have seen is, is people that, you know, blue collar folks that the best they could ever hope for was to make 12 to 15 bucks an hour. And they're making a lot more than that now. And so their entire quality of life has changed. And we see the, you know, anecdotally we see how that impacts just our retail sales in the community. Um, because those people are coming down here spending money. And, you know, the, there are so many businesses that are dependent on it. I mean, you can go up into into the county, and there are just these these times that of, of the day when, when you see them. Um, I was at my parents' house in Hebrew Springs one night, and was speaking to the Hebrew Springs Rotary Club. It was a breakfast meeting, so you know, as I was getting up and driving into town, I passed a gas station, and there were probably twenty at that time, Chesapeake trucks, gassing up, going inside, buying sandwiches, buying chips, you know, well that's happening every morning in these little towns. You know, every morning that's happening. And so the impact is, is far beyond the city of Conway. I mean, it, it, it's probably more dramatic in some of the, the smaller towns that had almost nothing going on. And then suddenly, you know, the little Cafe is having to bring on three or four more waitresses to just take care of the rush at, at lunch. <coughs> and so, you know, it, that's the great thing to me is that there's so many small business, locally owned small businesses that have been impacted in a, in a really good way. Um, I don't think the industry has done a great job, and I mean, I've said this to them, so I'm not saying anything that, that they haven't heard me say. I don't think they've done a good job as an industry, and I'm not saying win in particular <laughs> as a group. I don't think they've done a good job of communicating that. That it's not just about the guy sitting in the Southwestern Energy Building. It's about the lady who has the the you know hamburger stand in Damascus or the guy who has a store and equipment. Um, it's just it's changed a lot. Is there anything that you should have done important, you know, that, that would be something that you would need to, to be prepared for. Um, Commercial and residential? Um, I was thinking, well, I was really thinking more industrial. You know, I mean, we've sold, we've sold several tracks to suppliers, um, and then we've had several private developers in town go in and do the same. You know, there, and it, and it always, it, it seems to come in waves, too. There would be, there would be a wave of, for several months of where we would see, you know, I mean, th there was one day in particular where we had three different vendors that showed up at the same time saying, we, we've got to have a building. We've got to have 10,000 square feet. We've got to have 5,000 square feet. And I mean, we were just trying to put them wherever we could. Put on. Um, that was 
that was a unique situation because I had to take one and Jamie Gates had to take one and TJ had to take one because they, they literally, I mean, they'll just show up. They will show up on your door. Or, yeah, yeah, they'll start showing up. Just the, out of uh, the, the Southwestern, do they direct people to the chamber or people just look that most of them are Most of them are savvy them. enough because they've done this before. They're savvy enough to know that they can go to you and that you'll have <laughs> everything out there. And so, you know, with some of them, um, some of them would come in and they would want land. Well, we own land, obviously. Um, and we don't sell that for cheap. You know, I was telling uh, Cammy that, you know, we 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 sold tracks for seventy six thousand dollars an acre to these vendors, or to a developer working with a vendor. You know, because that that's really what it is most of the time is the vendor is not going to own the building. They they have a developer that's going to go in and buy it, and build the building, and lease it to them. Um, and then George Covington, who owns a lot of property in town, he's built an entire park full of, you know, and he, he's got kind of the, the one-stop deal. He owns the <coughs> property, he's got a construction company, so he can go in and he'll, you know, he'll throw up the building, and he's, you can see how he's perfected it over the years of, uh, you know, five to 10,000 square foot buildings with storage yards, and, uh, and obviously, you know, if, if you were to look at what we've done here versus what's happened in the county, the quality is a lot better here. I mean, it just looks a lot better. Now, there's some stuff, there's some stuff out in the county that looks pretty rough. But, you know, I don't think you want to get into county zoning. That's probably the right thing you want to get, get into. You know, we, we're pretty strict here. I mean, Conway's got very strict zoning standards. And, and they're, those vendor buildings look a lot different now than they did when they when they started. I think one of my concerns is that in this area you had no oil and gas vendors. I mean, it was all Peruvian territory. Whereas down in Magnolia, we've already got you know union supply, Liberty supply. How the, the and this may be a question for Southwestern that you might know. The Southwestern Schlumberger is here is because they were, if not exclusive, nearly exclusive with Southwestern. You know, Halliburton is in Cersei. Uh, <coughs> but Schlumberger chose Conway because they knew Southwestern was going to base themselves here. Well, we had Schlumberger mm -hmm. in Magnolia. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Aren't they out of there now? Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think they're the ones. Are they aren't the ones that are doing the well placement. Schlumberger. But, but we have we have several. I mean, in addition to Schlumberger and, and Halliburton, I mean, they're members of the chamber. But uh, <coughs> Calfrack is over in BB. They're members of our chamber. They're a big fracking company. Cut Energy Services is in Bologna. Um, you know, that's a they probably have two three hundred people in Bologna. You know, the only business Bologna had was a, a school. You know, I mean, huge school. And that's where people work. And now Cud is there. And that, that's an example of where, you know, Cud came to us first and we weren't willing to really discount a property for them. And I was okay with doing that. My board was okay because them being in Bologna is as good as them being in Conway, really. And so, um, so that kind of filtered out over time that, that, you know, the people that really wanted to be here for whatever reason, <coughs> their services primarily, um, they'll come here regardless of what it, I mean, now I'm sure we could get way out of line on price and lose them, but that's, that's not what our experience was. What, 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 what about your trip to Cleveland, Texas, that you all know what you learned? Um, well, we had never even seen 
So just just driving <coughs> through their industrial parks and seeing those buildings with the storage yards and what those folks would need, that was helpful because that we had no idea. We didn't know what that was going to be. Um, I think it was very good for our elected officials to to kind of go through, well, you know, here's what it means to roads, and here's what people are going to say, and here's why people are going to be angry, and, and you know, here's what it means regarding water. So, well, was, can you tell us about those, or would that be the mayor? And the that's mayor really, and that's really the mayor, and, and really the judge is going to, you're probably going to get a lot more from him, because he's out there on the, on the line every day, you're, you're laughing, you know. Um, and, and, and one thing he did say in Cleveland that day, I'll never forget, he said, um, you know, you're going to have, he said, you don't have to worry about the big guys. You don't have, it, for them it was XTO. You don't have to worry about XTO. What you have to worry about are really these fly-by-night companies who come in and they don't, they don't care about the long term. They're there to make a quick buck and sell to the XTOs of the world, and then they're up and out. He said, those are the people that you have to worry about because they're the ones that are going to make a mess. They're the ones that aren't going to do things properly. And, um, you know, Preston can probably tell you if that's true or not here, um, but I would imagine that it, that it is. When you found out that the, that <coughs> Just in time. We're getting, we're getting into it. We're getting into your business now. No, come on up. This is Preston Scroggin. He's our he's our county judge. Some of you know him. What was the question? I'm sorry. When, Here, Preston. when they first announced that, you know, Eureka we found that the well was made and all that, did they come to you and talk to you about that? Or did y'all just hear like everybody else did through a media announcement or what time was that process? The well, the well had really already made by the time. The first well that was discovered in the state was for uh, shale formation was in Conway County, it was Jerusalem, Arkansas. And these companies are real good about when they go into an area, they're, they're pretty secret and, 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 and can be. Uh, Southwest Energy drilled that first well and, and they had success. And over about a six to eight month period, you started seeing the land show up, you started seeing the title searches and stuff, you started hearing, and that's kind of how we were what, what, what year was that? Year? 2005. Okay. So we, we got in on it after that, obviously after that had happened, and then, you know, we, we helped them initially find temporary office space, and they went out by the uh, interstate in some office space that Axiom had vacated a couple years before, and and really grew into that until they built their new their new headquarters, and uh, they were on top of each other by the time that building finished out there. It's my understanding Southwest is on the edge of about half a million acres. Yeah, yeah. Right. So they're, yeah. So that, that tells me that they're, they're pretty sure. Uh, and that's exciting. Fracture technology in those old old bearing. That's been the biggest issue that I've had to deal with. 
many days that we have, and we'll get it fixed when they're done. We'll keep it you know, passable until then. Uh, you didn't make any response for it in some way, pressing it on. The companies, the companies. Yeah, the companies have totally, all the companies here have totally stepped up and took care of it. What we've done, uh, we've all laid out the Southwest and XTO and Chesapeake, if, it, if they were on a road and there was uh, three of them on the road, we'd figure up the percentage. Uh, we had an engineer that Southwest brought into the mix that works now in this five county region. He works for all the companies now. He went in and would make an estimate on what it was going to take to fix that road. The company would agree to it. Uh, we would come in and actually do the work as a county uh, and they would pay for the material. Uh, it worked out very well. We were able to come in. Most of the time, we came in 20, 25% under the engineer's estimate, so they have their own equipment and uh, Did they pay anything for labor or just the material? Just material. Just material. Yeah. And that's worked out pretty good. I mean, some of, some, some of the northern part of our county, uh, some of these chip fill roads are kind of three and four inch asphalt roads mm -hmm. and three. not very rough. What they have discovered here, uh, when they first started drilling the wells, they were trucking the water in. Now, it's amazing. They're pumping this water 8 to 10 miles in our area. Uh, they'll, they'll find a farm pond or, or a lake. They'll pump this water two or three miles to another pond or a lake and have to re -lift pump. They'll take it on from there, maybe go to another one. And, but they've got very good at pumping the water. They'll run, you know, six and eight inch aluminum line When they first started, uh, Southwest was a big leader. Southwell built over 175 reservoirs on private property. They were going into agreement with the landowner and say, hey, we'll build you a five to 10 acre water town and you can have it for recreational use and everything. The only thing we'll do is when we need to frack a well, we'll you know, have a right to the water. Uh, Corps of Engineers and the EPA <coughs> and several others got involved, soil and water. There were some concerns about the going in on these farms and, and you know impounding these small streams. So now it's a lot more difficult for them to build those impoundments. So those impoundments have really dropped off. Um, what you're seeing happening now is a lot of private citizens are either building these lakes or already had them on their farm for farm hunters. Uh, the average well here right now they're paying about the average frack job. And Got a pond that's got the water in it, about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for that water for that one track. Uh, there's actually some people that we know we grew up up in that country that are. I know one gentleman this year that probably cleared one hundred fifty thousand dollars on water. He had a about a ten acre lake that's been in the family for twenty five years. It was on a pretty pretty <coughs> healthy stream on his farm and had a lot of springs. And, and every time I drove, it was uncommon. You know, every time I drove by there, he was selling water for a track. So uh, you're, you're seeing that now while the private citizens of course Southwest was thinking ahead and, and got most of their impoundments in. Uh, uh, XTO and, and BHP are still having to look at streams. Uh, of course, soil and water, or whatever they are now, NRCS, or <laughs> they, they are really monitoring that. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got several agencies that monitor the oil and gas commission as part of it. Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality has some of it. And then Randy Young's field, A and NRC, I keep changing, has, has the water. <coughs> they make them put in logs how much they're using it and what they're using it. Now. What about the disposal of this? Okay. <laughs> you know, y'all are here to, to hear the good, the bad. Um, we went through a time um, where on disposal <laughs> wells, they, they tried some in this country. The geology of this, and I try to study on it, it's, it's beyond me. Those, most of those wells are anywhere from 10 to 15,000 feet. Um, if they look for rock and, and forms, they, they call it a spongy material. I know a lot of it's come to the other part of the world because of that, that old oil bearing the drought that was able to take it because of the uh, we, we had some hiccups uh, here. We, we handled them. Wells that were drilled that shouldn't have been drilled. They were in 
have some wells on up in Polk County, uh, Fort Smith, um, uh, up in that area that, that, that they're able to go to that is geologically suitable for that water. So, you know, I, I guess the biggest thing I can tell you is, is you know, I'll just say right here, it's, it's been economically very stable. <coughs> things I'd like to hear the both of you address that you sort of touched on but but seems to be a certain unwillingness to talk about it. First of all is zoning in the county. Uh, what would you like to do or what have you done to control development uh, in things such as RV camps? Second part, second issue uh, was for you Mr. Lacey has to do with wages. And, and what this has done to the labor market. Uh, our city, for instance, has you know, great trouble trying to hire a patrolman at $28,000 a year. And now here's an industry that will have jobs at sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Uh, this area has you know, a lot of people in it. Our area is depopulated. You know, we, have, uh, we don't have enough people in our area. Uh, to, to fill the jobs that we have. I, I'd just like to hear the both of you uh, address this. Well, I'll, I'll start with your last question. I am, uh, I mean, I think I would never try to inhibit a company coming here because of what they pay. If it requires everyone else to pay more, then I think that's a good thing. I mean, that's what, that's the business I'm in every day. Is if it if it moves if it moves the entire wage structure up, then the rising tide lifts all boats. Right there. now, now here here is some truth that we saw in, in manufacturing. There were some manufacturing operations that lost people initially, but then they gained some of those people back because it's hard work. I mean, it's it's not it's twenty four seven. It's the hours are different. It's it is strenuous. Um, and so there were there was a period of time where there was just not equilibrium, I guess, and and I think that you know that worked itself out. Um, I would I would suggest that you probably look at um, areas like the the Bakken Shell in North Dakota right now. If you followed any of that in Williston, you know there's twenty something thousand jobs that are open there. Well, I mean people are moving there to get those jobs. I mean I wouldn't look at the you know, if, if this thing hits, you should look at it as a great opportunity to repopulate your area. Um, and, and it could happen fast if, if what has happened up there is any indication. Um, and that's what you need to be prepared for is, you know, where do they live? You know, how are you going to, how are you going to um, accommodate them? Um, but that, we have not 
I've seen, you know, I've watched some stuff on on that area, and um, you know, they were saying how the entire wage structure had changed, and even like fast food people were making ten and eleven dollars an hour. Well, we didn't see that here, and, and it may be because it, it is bigger, um, but but we didn't really see an inflation of the of the wage structure for the, the typical entry level entry level person. I think it was a little bit uh, it was a little bit taxing on the manufacturing base for probably the first year until people figured out if they wanted to work in oil and gas or not. startling sales tax figures for Van Buren County. Um, you know, very rural, lost their two largest employers manufacturing-wise, and their sales tax went up a hundred percent increase in a year in a year's time. I mean, a very rural county that, that just you didn't really have a lot going on, and then you see this spike. schools now, we've got one of them in our county and several of them in every county, their division is they all. I mean, they get so much in on property tax that they actually send a check to the State Department of Education. We've got five or six school districts now that are actually sending money back. Around $8.3 I think, last year was sent back to some of those schools. Uh, and you'll, you'll have, Judge, you'll have some people get irritated when they have to pay property tax on, on several Yeah, that's been on the books for 80 plus years. But back on your, your workforce planning for your rig type things, what type of workforce training programs are, have been implemented in the area to prepare people to, to work on those kind of jobs? Well, UACC Morrillton did the best job of, of getting a program developed in petroleum technology because obviously that wasn't here. I mean, those skill sets weren't here. The knowledge wasn't here. Um, you know, so in those initial days, we were bringing, I mean, we were importing a lot of folks from other parts of the United States to work. You know, what you're starting to see now is it's just Arkansans, good, hardworking Arkansans that are going to go through that training, get the certificate, and go to work in one of many of those. I think they duplicated that program at a couple of other two-year schools. I think they did that. 
disconcerting that those areas you mentioned that company since closed shop and we've worked I guess two years now to get that zoning issue handled and I think you go what three three times? No, we can have the authority to go three times, yeah. but we've only gone down that one general area. Okay. So we we exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction beyond our city limits, which is extremely controversial and we're limited to that one area. But we really had a Could you elaborate just a little bit on what these restrictions are? Uh, now they have to, before they can just go in, of course, this, we had a lot of rapid growth before the, the shale play, uh, but you know, we, we require studies on runoff, water runoff. Uh, we require engineering studies on the roads. Uh, we require uh, feedback from the health department and what they're seeing from soil engineering and things. Uh, we've got two classes. Can you go into the details of, of what that was? As far as visiting with the industry? Well, the, the roads. Uh, we, had no, we had no codes or anything. We had just kind of been up to uh, whatever happened to come along. Uh, you know, the residential code was something that was bore out of all the uh, growth that we've had in our county <coughs> and the city as well. Um, I think we keyed in more on the commercial code said earlier, these uh, operations going in, we would have a company that would come in and buy 20 acres. Uh, Guy Arkansas is a prime example. Guy's a small town, about 400, I think, and, and they had a, a industrial park that went in, in the county, but it went up to the city limits. And um, the developers came to us and wanted us to take the road in, and it was, it, <laughs> to be honest, it was horrible. And uh, we said, we've got to you know, take some action.
be the most important person in this whole thing. The county, I mean, we rely on Preston. I mean, Preston, your, your county judge is the most important person in that relationship building. And in, I mean, he has an incredible relationship with them. And I think that we have a successful relationship with the industry because of his relationship, and, and not just him, but the other county judges in the area. I mean, they've really stuck together, done the right thing, balanced the economic good of the region with, you know, the environmental good of the region and the roads. But you'll be you'll be the you'll be the key to it. <laughs> you have a little. The, bit I don't more. know if you wanted to hear that today, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Yeah, that. It, sure. It's a, it's a workload. <coughs> city um, you know, we're really outside of play so we don't for the most part reap the benefits of play without having to pay the cost of it. One of the problems we did see with some of the more fly by night companies was they would come in and take a storefront in a strip center and store all kinds of things in there that was that shouldn't be stored in there. Uh, if you don't have business licenses so that you can check what's what activities are going on in a particular location, you should get them. I say that we still don't have
five gallon drum for something that shouldn't be there right next to the wall that you shared with the toilet shop or whatever else. So they will do stuff like that. So the PPP is an excellent part. And, and I have to reach out, you know, as long as I'm here, so I get to be retired. I mean, <laughs> one of the biggest helps to me when I first got into I was still in the state house when that was, was Cleveland, Texas, made some great friends down there. calls as I placed down here <laughs> all hours a day and that just and with, with people down there that were a big help to me. And I talked a little bit about us going down there and, and uh, did we not um, tab didn't our fire department connect with them or with Fort Worth and I mean, you maybe talked about that and why we did that. Did we just we just went down to Cleveland because we we were basically the same thing you did. Want to see what happened, you know, how it may take <coughs> basically from the word go we were told it's good. It's not all good. Schlumberger, for instance, when we uh, we had to get special zoning for them because of the chemicals that they use. They right? actually have uh, a, a, a nuclear component that we had to put a special provision on zoning as well. It's very controlled, it's very small, but we have a nuclear component that's a part of their process. I have a question. Um, money into like uh, the community for uh, quality of life issues like the arts and things like that, nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They Southwest grant energy. money to them. <laughs> Southwestern Energy has been, well, let me say this. They are, we have, we, we continue to have trouble, I would say, getting good participation out of the vendors. Um, there's no real connection there, if I'm being honest. Southwestern Energy is great. They're one of our largest contributors at the chamber, uh, longtime sponsor of the Conway Symphony Orchestra. I mean, since day one, they're one of the lead concert sponsors. Um, so they're very benevolent. Um, you know, if I have a criticism, it is that a lot of the vendors, we, we get nothing out of it. I mean, we can't even get a chamber membership out of it because I don't think they understand what we do. Now, you know, if the industry, when the industry is under attack in the legislature and we're down there fighting for them, they still don't understand what we're doing. They, they, don't, they don't make the connection that if Southwestern Energy goes away, then all of them go away. And so that's my, that is my frustration. And that's something that, that honestly we have to work on through SWIN. I mean, they're, they're the ones that can help us get that. Um, outside of them though, They've been great, Chesapeake's great, which now it's BHP. Um, but anything below them, not really. You, know, you don't see much. You know, in Echo, like Southwest, uh, uh, Chesapeake did the same thing. They had been totally bought out at this time. When we, when we had the tornado here in our county back there for 25th, uh, Southwest Energy shut down their, basically shut their pipeline division down. And when I got back on April 26th at daylight, and track hose and employees and probably 60 trucks and chainsaws and everything else and they were really help. Chesapeake has done the same. XPO just about two weeks ago finally got in a little bit. They they uh, helped some people with some uh, uh, manufactured housing and lost their homes during the tornado. Um, of course, go back. Southwest did $10,000 for Bologna Ballpark got wiped out. They didn't have no place to play softball. Zone. Southwest did 10,000 sent their crews out on the weekend to help. And Southwest gives to United Way in a big way. And, you know, the, the company, of course, Southwest, being on top, that uh, they, they do a lot. Like Brad said, there is a disconnect. I know when you had the chamber drive, it's always, did 
you can get Southwest to call them there. <laughs> That's the thing. If they call them, they'll join in immediately. We never get them pulled off long enough to do it. Now, renewal is a different story. We'll, I mean, we actually had the CEO of Southwestern Energy send renewal letters on our behalf. <laughs> <laughs> that helped with renewals a lot. That, that got their attention. It did get their attention on why that might be important. So, um, but overall, I, mean, I, I can't say enough good about them. And I'll tell you, their building that you'll that you'll go to this afternoon, um, it was really designed with community events in mind, and we had a big um, fundraiser for the hospital. It was an art um, an art auction, really, uh, on behalf of the hospital foundation, and they opened their building up. It was great. It was it was really nice, and so um, they're very they're they're very benevolent. They're they're Chamber and ED side, you know, what, what they're going to, you know, if, if this matures or whatever, you know, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared to fight for us. I mean, that's, that's the, the value that they see in us as an organization is that we're willing to be vocal and we're willing to mix it up and we're willing to um, testify on their behalf. We're willing to lobby on their behalf. And we wouldn't think twice about that. I mean, we know what it means for us. The stakes are high for us. Anything that reduces the amount of money that those three companies spend in the Fayetteville Shell is incredibly damaging to us. Unfortunately, it's also incredibly damaging to the economy of our state, and we have some people that don't understand that. So I, I, I told uh, our two o'clock talk <laughs> was really about. I mean, I'm I'm as hopeful as anybody who probably doesn't live there that this happens for you guys. I mean, I am so hopeful because we need more advocates for this industry in our state, and it needs to be spread geographically so that there are alliances <coughs> there that that maybe don't exist today, um, and, and so I'm excited and hopeful for you guys. Now, have they started drilling already in the south? Is there, they're having some success, I guess. Well, they, they completed one well in Columbia County, but don't really have it on the line, and I think they, they're going to announce the results of that in their first quarter public report. They're drilling in Sabre Parish, Louisiana, which is the adjoining parish, Right now, I guess I'm assuming, and, and then the, as I understand it, they've already noted uh, have the, the location designated for the next one is that well. Now this is the, this one comes from Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. I heard the Cabot Oil and Gas is working in that area. Cabot's still on Union County. The Union County is still on Union County. Have there been any very secret press? Talk all that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> trust me, they will be. And, you know, I'll, a little side note, Judge, and anybody, uh, if they do hit and they all of a sudden have a rush, one thing that happened in our five counties is, is we had to really be careful with our deep books and everything. Right. Uh, we had a lot of them tore up and you know, we, had to, we had to limit time in the vault. And it, if it takes off, you'll see something. You'll see those landmen, they'll, the Pearl Circuit Clerk will be <laughs> inundated <laughs> in those two or three courthouses. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you, you know, one company, and I, I don't know, it was you know, they, they negotiated exclusive rights with the uh, abstract offices and things like that. You know, I, I gave you an interesting tidbit. I, I, I love to see it. But Southwest Energy, when they first started releasing in 2005, their average lease was uh, $25 an acre and 12% royalty. Wow. And by the time everything matured, it's now 20%. 
Julia, don't we pretty much have the pipelines in place already? I would already? think so, for the most part. Yeah. I think mean, we are crisscrossed yeah. between yeah. the brine and the, uh, and the oil and yeah. gas. Yeah. So. Some of the best asphalt that will come from down here. It's too. probably better for us, more so than transmission lines. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. gas yeah. would be yeah. something yeah. that yeah. they would yeah. get into that lot of gas. You know, the tractor and technology. Really, what they're doing is not going to hurt your drinking water. Any person who drills a well could hurt your drinking water if they don't do it right. Well, and, and I guess I don't, I've tried to keep up with, are they, how deep are they drilling down here? 10,000. 10,000 feet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. They can frack all they want to, they're not going to frack up into mm -hmm. our drinking water. But it's when you're drilling through the drinking water, any operator could harm your drinking water. That's not done right. No, so it's really not what's happening today that's going to be any different from what we've done we've for 100 years. We've not had any basement failures in the five county region yet. It's pretty good. And we're always going to have some folks that I've got some up here on the blog that I'm the devil incarnate. Who are, you know, being the supporter of the end. But, you know, I can tell them, folks, if you enjoy yeah. the good time,
grow as fast as we have generally. We actually do we're fine right now, but we have to expand on all of those activities. So we're looking to do that. Sounds like seeing a lot of uh, rental houses in the county too. It's what we did, okay. yeah. You, know, it, it, you will see an increase in rental in your city and in the county. And just, and like I said, some reason those folks left to rent. So I wish it could be cleaned up, but but then you get these again, you get these odd forces. And anytime you want to change that law, and I mean Lou Hart is one that put it into that, that super kind of high majority vote. Uh, but right now the only option is wet or dry, and you don't have that middle ground, which I really think a lot of communities would vote for. But what's interesting is is that you know I never thought you'd see Clark County go wet. I mean there or both. I mean. I mean, if, if somebody has the wherewithal to collect the signatures to get it on the ballot, it's going to pass. I mean, th that's that's the deal. I mean, if you can get 38% of those registered voters to put it on the ballot, then you've already won. If you can get that many people to sign it. Uh, you know, for us, it's, it's a huge ordeal just because of the sheer number that you would have to get. I mean, that's not going to be my deal. That could be somebody else's <laughs> because we got... We got the restaurants, and that's what we wanted all along. I mean, and it's it's worked out exceptionally well for us. And now a panel. <laughs> yeah, most recently. Great. Your home went off, but we want the piano. But once again, a great reuse of the building. You want to talk about the one of the iconic buildings in our community, the old Smith Ford building. Um, you know, Smith family is the oldest. Ford dealership west of the Mississippi and under continuous ownership and their original building was probably built in the teens or twenties and 
great old building that has sat there. <coughs> nothing in it. I mean, the, the last business that was in it was an insulation business. And now, completely transformed piano bar, live music venue. And so, it's starting. 